All right, welcome once again uh, to the local church course. I hope you all are doing well. Thanks for joining in, guys. Uh, all right, let's uh, pray and we'll get started. Can I request uh, one of you to please lead us in prayer? Zelatoli, can I request you to start us off with prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for this session, Lord. As we begin our class, I pray that, Lord, you bless our pastor so that he can teach your word according to your will, empower him, and give him your wisdom, your grace to teach uh, this morning also, and bless each one of us who are going to attend the class, Lord. You lead us, Holy Spirit. You guide us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Great. Uh, all right, so let's... Uh, you know, start with where we left off last week. Um, so we we concluded with the chapter uh, chapter fourteen. It talks about the local church as the temple uh, of God and how it was in the temple that God manifested His glory. Uh, it was in the temple that He it, it which was His dwelling place was His resting place. And then uh, how we as a church. Are also known or called to be the temple of God all right and the whole purpose and the objective and the point of the temple uh, was not just for the sake of having a temple temple of God the point was um, that it was his sanctuary that God was dwelling it was a dwelling place for him all right and so that's how we looked at uh, it and how we are called to be our local churches have to be a sanctuary um, we as individuals and as a collective are called to be um, uh, the temple of God where he dwells uh, among us in us as well right um, so we, today we'll uh, we'll continue with chapter 15 where we talk about the local church as Zion uh, as God's chosen people right um can someone read for us um the scripture in the notes uh, hebrews chapter 12 is 22 to 24 please hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 to 24 but you have come to mount Zion and to the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to god the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect to jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of evil thank you right so uh yeah, we see that the writer of Hebrews is very clear in uh, in in explaining or in telling that uh, through it's through Jesus Christ that uh, we are now part of uh, we we are His people. We are part of Mount Zion. Okay, now we're going to talk about it in detail in this chapter about uh, um, the old the way it was viewed in the Old Testament and in you know, the way it's viewed in the New Testament and all of that. Right, uh, but so the New Testament believers are referred to uh, with an Old Testament term. Um, as Zion, which means we are chosen people, we are God's chosen people. It's as simple as that, right? Um, so, uh, and then we see that Apostle Peter also refers to Zion as church, right? And we see that in First Peter chapter two, verse six. Um, Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture: "Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect." precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame okay so here peter is saying that hey we are part of zion we are god's chosen people and jesus is the chief cornerstone of it all right and and we've and we've been reading about this from the beginning that how he is the head of the church right jesus is the head of the church as a body of christ jesus is our head right and and similarly here in a different language or different terminology so to say that uh, we as his people his chosen people he's our chief cornerstone right and we go on to say uh, that uh, in uh, let's read that verse again first peter chapter 2 verse 6 therefore it is also contained in the scripture behold i lay in zion uh, i lay i rest that's my dwelling place 
right? It's a place. Uh, it, again, in the Old Testament, it was a, it, it, it was so much more. It was a mount where the the temple was built, right? The mount Zion. That's why it's called Mount Zion. The temple, the sanctuary was there. God dwelt in that sanctuary. Okay, uh, but let's a little bit of, of that a little later. Uh, and so, and Peter goes on to explain, uh, you know, in the same chapter, First Peter chapter two, verse nine to twelve, and uh, some of the words that we are familiar of, and you've heard already, says, "But you are a chosen generation, right? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, his own special people, uh, that you may proclaim the praises of him." And so, when we realize that we are his chosen people. And his chosen people were known, uh, called as Zion, right? And then you see everything, okay, there was this temple of God that was built on, that was set on Mount Zion. And then everybody who were involved, they were what? The Levitical priesthood, isn't it? Right? They were the priesthood. Uh, they were considered to be uh, the holy tribe set apart for God. Um, and if you read their history, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy uh, and Numbers, uh, God says, "Okay, for the tribe of Dan, they get this piece of land. For this, you know, this this tribe gets this piece of land, and this tribe gets this piece of land, and this tribe, you know, goes on. They get that piece of land. And when it came to the tribe of Levites, uh, God says they are not going to get any uh, any inheritance in the form of a land." I am going to be their inheritance. I am their inheritance, um, right? It's it. So that's the most. It's the most beautiful thing. And then now, fast forward to the New Testament, New Covenant. Um, we see that He is our inheritance, right? Jesus is our inheritance. So those are the things that uh, you know Peter kind of highlights in First Peter chapter two, verse nine and twelve. That hey, we are His chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him and so this is a duty as his chosen people we are not chosen for the sake of being chosen and as i always say and then just go about doing whatever you want to do have fun no we are his special people a chosen generation that we may proclaim the praises of him Right? We are called to proclaim, declare right, um, uh, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Right? But once who were not a people. So in the Old Covenant, uh, I've mentioned this before, that there are only two kinds of people. One is the people in the covenant, and two, those who are not in the covenant. It's as simple as that, right? Um, and later I got to know that they they got the name called Hebrews, and then everybody else were Gentiles. So the Hebrews were the people in the covenant, and everybody else, Gentiles, didn't matter which uh, country you're from. It just means that you're a person who are not in the covenant, okay? And so verse 11, Peter says, Beloved, I beg you as surgeons and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Right? Uh, so, Gentiles observe. Uh, everybody observes, everybody sees, and then there's this standard being raised for us. It's like, hey, you are being watched. Because you are my people, the way you do life is very important. Because you represent me, right? Uh, that's the word we use very often, isn't it? Represent. And then in, when you break it, you are representing, right? And as Paul says, we become his ambassadors, ambassadors of Christ, um, right? And what we do, how we do, uh, is being observed. And uh, even when it came to, uh, we we studied a little bit about sonship glory. We studied about glory and sonship glory in the last class, 
right? If you remember how Jesus displayed, demonstrated, manifested sonship glory in everything that he did, he revealed the Father. In other words, he represented the Father. And so Jesus goes on to say that, hey, if you don't believe me, it's okay, fine. At least see the works that I am doing. Right? And then believe. Because all my works display and reveal who God is, who the Father is. Right? And so um, the standard is being set a little high here right now. I mean, we all know that. And uh, so as his people, uh, we are his chosen people. We are called uh, to praise him, to proclaim him, uh, right? And and to have a have a, a conduct of life uh, that is uh, appreciated and has an impact on the Gentiles, right? So uh, let's take a uh, just a little brief history of Zion, right? So in page uh, one hundred and eight, uh, Zion again is God's chosen people now. And as you read through um, the Old Testament, right, you see that word evolves. Okay, uh, it's as mentioned in the notes. It's first. Uh, it's it, it's found, it's mentioned for the first time in Second Samuel, uh, chapter five, uh, verse seven. Right, it's, it's referred to a specific mountain, a physical, geographical, and actual mountain, right, which was known as Mount. Zion, right, on which uh, it was a, a stronghold that had to be captured, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen forts in your life. Uh, you know, a forts kind of they are like stronghold, isn't it? And so, if if any if an enemy wanted to conquer or invade uh, a land geographically, right, militarily. Uh, they had to defeat a stronghold. It's a stronghold. The place has a, a stronghold on it, so the enemy cannot penetrate, right? Um, and so Mount Zion was such a place uh, like that. Uh, it was uh, inhabited by the Jebusites, uh, right? And then David had to conquer, defeat them militarily. And once that was done, it was later also known as an extension of Jerusalem, as the city of David. So Mount Zion was not too far away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem originally, uh, you know, was known, later becomes known as the city of David. And then Mount Zion is attached uh, to it as well. Right. So it's a city of David. Mount Zion is also known as the city of David. And so David... Uh, after David captures uh, the stronghold of Zion, where you can read all about it in First Kings and First Chronicles and Second Chronicles, uh, which is called as a city of David, right? And it is on that mount uh, where Solomon also builds the temple, right? And then uh, you see uh, Zion expanded in meaning to include the temple and the area surrounding it, which is the city of Jerusalem as well right so uh and now as i mentioned the word kind of evolves right from mount zion you you can see as you read through the old testament it uh it was eventually used uh for people it's like okay they are the people of zion it simply means chosen people Right, so Zion was eventually used as the name of the city for Jerusalem, the land of Judah, and the people of Israel as a whole. Okay, so, so Zion was eventually used as the name for the city of Jerusalem, the land of Judah, which was the nation of Judah, and the people of Israel as a whole. Okay, um, and so, and that was referred to the people in the covenant and then fast forward to the new testament uh the new covenant uh we are now the people of the covenant as well that means we are the chosen people we are part of zion as just as we read in hebrews chapter 12 verse 20, 22 and 24 but you have come to mount zion right the hebrew writer says to the city of the living god a heavenly jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly of and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven right so we've been uh like baptized baptized as in what brought into immersed into this kingdom um, of god right so we are his people now okay and so uh what's this what's the big deal about all this talk on zion 
right? Um, God dwells, once again, he dwells and rules in Zion. Right? Zechariah chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, he says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. Right? Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. Right? If you remember what Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, For God is enthroned on the praises of his people. Another version says, like, In the midst of his people, he is enthroned. Right? He again, guys. I mean, this the heart of God is so amazing. It's just uh, in so many different ways, and so many different words, and so many different expressions. Uh, God is saying, "I will be your God. You will be my people," and He's saying that, and He's expressing that in so many different ways. Right? Okay. So uh, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. I will tabernacle uh, in your midst. Right? And Psalm 2, verse 6 and 8, it says, uh, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Right? You see that? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. There is this bringing into this family. There is a declaration of you know saying, I am yours and you are mine. And all of this is happening and is being declared from the holy hill of Zion, right? And then goes on to say, Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Like who can give nations or lands as inheritance? Only a king can do that, right? Only the king who can who's reigning and ruling has the right and the authority to give a piece of land as their inheritance, right? It's like a scroll, right? Uh, you know, one of this uh, imagery that comes to my mind uh, is from the imagery of, uh, you know, Jesus in Revelation, what John is seeing in Revelation chapter 5. He says, uh, is there, you know, I turned and looked around, there was, uh, you know, he was weeping because there was no one worthy to open the scroll because the scroll represented inheritance. And because there was no one, uh, you know, we it, John was feeling like I'm left as an orphan because there was no one to open the scroll worthy enough to open the scroll to inherit, right? And so the story, the history of the scroll is the only the one who is worthy could open it, right? So, uh, so I think sometime somewhere in the 70s, right? I hope you guys are still alive, but so sometime in the 70s, uh, the scroll of caesar julius caesar was found okay uh, the inheritance it was the archaeologist kind of discovered it found it and uh you know only the person from his lineage or his descendant can open the scroll uh and not even the archaeologist who found it uh, well is it, it, it was it's illegal nobody can do that Right, uh, only his descendant was worthy enough to open the scroll. So that's that's the story here. Is it's only the king, who's ruling and reigning, can say, "Hey, I ask me. I will give you the nations as your inheritance because now you are my son, and today I have begotten you, and you are mine. I can give you whatever I want to give." Like ask away kind of thing, right? And so he dwells uh, and rules among his people, right? God dwells and rules among his people. He, he dwells. God rests, okay? He's tabernacled. In the previous chapter, we saw that the church is the temple of God. And it is in his temple where God dwells and he rests. And because now we are called the temple of God, and now we are his chosen people, God chooses to rule and reign through his church. That is, through you and me. Are you with me? 
right? So we are his people to see his rule and kingdom extend through the nations and to the ends of the earth. And no wonder Jesus taught us to pray like, you know, our father who art in heaven, I will be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We are praying, right? So uh, it is through us that his kingdom is manifested, right? Because we are his chosen people, we are his church. So God dwells and rules in Zion. Another aspect that we see is that out of Zion, he shines. Right? Out of Zion, he shines. Okay, so once again, the temple was in, in the mount. That means it's not difficult for us to not see what is on the mount, right? Everybody can see uh, the temple on the mount. Uh, and you know that we all know that that's where God dwells. And, and if you look at the tabernacle of Moses, I'm sure you've seen some images of it. Um, it says, he led them by cloud as cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? And um, the tabernacle of Moses had three partitions, the outer courts, inner courts, and the holy of holies, right? And so there was this uh, cloud, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire, you know, from the holy of holies that would rise up to the skies. I mean, some images I'm... It's not like I've seen the tabernacle of Moses, but then some images and also the way the scriptures painted, you can imagine, right? Um, and so that is to say that every tribe that was camped or encamped around the tabernacle, every tribe and every nation surrounding could see that the glory of God was resting in his place. And that means a glory with the glory. I mean, this, this brightness, this light. And so, in other words, he was shining from his throne on earth. Right? And so Psalm 50, verse 1 and 2 says, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty <laughs> God will shine forth, right? Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. So God desires, and now that we are his chosen people, he desires to manifest and shine through you and me, through the local church, as individuals and as a collective, right? Uh, Again, the classic uh, scripture that I'm reminded is that we are called to be the light of the world, isn't it? And that it is his light that shines through us. Um, so, yeah, more on that a little later, uh, probably in the next chapter. So, uh, God displays his glory and splendor out of Zion. And now in the new covenant, we are Zion, we are his chosen people, and he desires to shine through us. And the question comes back to us, and are we letting him shine through us? Are our lives uh, you know, portraying, uh, showing that imagery, and allowing him to shine through us, uh, right? And then there is deliverance on Mount Zion. Obadiah writes in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17 and 21, but on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Okay? On Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. There is freedom. Right? We've been delivered from darkness and brought into his marvelous light. Right? We've been delivered. And there shall be holiness. His people will be set apart. His people are called to live a life of holiness. His church is called to be holy, right? Uh, the, the Greek Latin word for church is what? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. That means called out or set apart, right? Um, so so I, when God says, I called you out of darkness and placed you into the most marvelous light, simply saying, I've set you apart. I have delivered you from darkness. 
right? So that means there is deliverance in his calling out. And then we are empowered to live a life of holiness. And there shall be holiness, right? And then it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say that the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. We will take what is rightfully ours, which is given to us by God. Right? And that's again, it's just going back and forth to Psalm 2 and says, ah, Now ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Right? So, what is rightfully ours will be given. Right? And then verse 21 gets interesting. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. So Esau, again, is represent symbolic of the enemy, right? So in, in, in the previous verse, we see Jacob. So Jacob and Esau, brothers, isn't it? So Jacob, again, represent the people in the covenant. Esau represents people of those who are not in the covenant. So in the new covenant, if the church, uh, the people in the covenant, the enemy, so Esau is a symbol of the enemy, the darkness, right? Uh, the kingdom of darkness. So, and it's go, it goes on to say that the church, we will have victory over the kingdom of the enemy, over the powers of darkness. Right? And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Right? So, just very quickly, just to quick recap, God dwells, okay? He dwells and reigns from Zion. Right? He shines out of Zion. There is deliverance on Mount Zion. Right? And, and as if all of that was uh, not good enough, uh, it gets even better. It says, the Lord roars from Zion. Right? Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 16 paints this beautiful imagery. He says, the Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Right? The Lord shall roar. And again, uh, everybody, the world will will know that the that God of all the earth is dwelling amongst us because his light shines just like in the tabernacle of Moses where every nation could see every tribe could see that God is dwelling and they were scared right they would know okay the presence of a holy is there right and then he roars from Zion that's a very uh, it's it's a, it's a battle ready kind of a thing is that I am with you right and so the voice of the lord is released from zion he will show forth his strength among from among his people right this is an awesome song by uh, paul wilbur uh, not sure if i think you guys know um what is it it's called can you hear it and you should listen to it okay so can you hear it a thunder in the distance when we worship the lion of judah roars There'll be victory in the camp at the shout of El Shaddai. Every enemy will flee uh, with the fire in his eyes. Um, so, yeah, that's one song you should listen to it. It's uh, amazing. All right, so the Lord roars from Zion, uh, as in he's, it's a mark of stamping his authority. He's saying, hey, this is my, this is my territory, right? Uh, we get the imagery of the lion roaring, saying, I am here. It's just to give a sign saying, you know, just letting everybody know I'm here. This is my territory or you are in my territory. Okay, you should know that I am the king. Um, so beware. You're treading on dangerous ground kind of thing, <clears throat> right? So uh, it's, it's beautiful to have this imagery to know. I mean, just with all these things to know that God dwells in us uh, he shines through us there's deliverance in his presence and we are as people are called to carry out uh, you know that the message of the gospel that that brings about healing and deliverance to people and because we've been given that authority right mount zion to judge the mountains of esau as the scripture says like hey uh, we are to go and bring about be the light uh, you know to the people in darkness, set them free because we have the authority over the powers of darkness and because also he roars uh, from Zion. 
right? Um, releasing the rod of his strength. Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Right? The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Right? So um, his rule and dominion, the rod of his strength, will go out of Zion. That is through his people. Through his people, he will rule among his enemies. That's the conclusion of everything uh, we've covered in this chapter. Right. So uh, practical ways a uh, local church can implement uh, this god's own people as zion we are god's own people we are his special people we have a heavenly citizenship uh and we are called to live with that perspective and i want to encourage all of us uh, as in if uh, i mean it is possible that you know uh we know all of this and we've lost the significance uh of this Right. Uh, it's like how John 3.16 is so popularly known and it's treated just like a memory verse kind of a thing. Uh, but we we miss the significance of it, the, the the awesomeness of that verse. Right. And and I think we just we just need to slow down sometimes and to know that we are his people, we are his special people, we have heavenly citizenship. Right in a in a day and age in a world that is doesn't believe in that there is uh, life after death or doesn't believe in heaven or hell um, believes in all sorts of things, and we have this hope that we are citizens of heaven. And that should mean something to us. That should uh, that should do something to us. That should change our perspective. Right, and so um, every local church must raise up a people who represent kingdom culture and values in this world. And these are the values, and these these are the kingdoms uh, culture. Isn't it? Every local church must raise up a people who are holy, sanctified, and living transformed lives, as Romans chapter twelve verse one and two states. Right, um, and. You know, when you can, and if you can, um, I would encourage you to do a, just a word study on what does it mean to be transformed, transformation in the context of Christian life. Okay, um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, you do a word study in the context of a Christian life of transformed, being transformed, transformation. What does it mean to be transformed, transformation? What are we transformed into? Um, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, you could also do a Bible study with your groups when you can. Okay, it's amazing. Um, another practical ways to implement this is call to show forth his praises. As God's own people, we are here to put on display God's greatness. Right? We are here for the world to see the greatness, the goodness, the virtues of our God uh, through us. Right, we are called to see his kingdom come and has his people the lord desires to release his kingdom through us we are here to see his kingdom come and his will be done right, um, and and just declare that over our congregation and, and equip our congregation empower our congregation the people that you lead um to to live a life like that right and what can be some of the challenges uh, that you can be uh, prepared for in this context uh, status quo Christianity will resist this kind of lifestyle. Um, it's too risky. Why can't I just come to Sunday every church and just go back home in peace and sleep, have my Sunday lunch, and you know, it, it's all good, isn't it? Why can't that's enough? It, um, it, is, it is too risky. It is non-conforming. It means we live as citizens of heaven. However, as pastors, leaders, we have no choice but to preach and teach so that people will be transformed by the renewing of the mind right um we've learned earlier on in this course that uh, change will be resisted uh but we can't just give up uh you know as leaders as pastors um we want the best for our congregation to press in for more right so uh, that's the chapter of the mount um at the local church as the mount um zion 
All right, uh, is, there, uh, is everybody good? Does anybody have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to add? Okay, all right, cool. Uh, at least in my vicinity, I can think of uh, more than five local churches uh, in the name of uh, Zion. So Zion Fellowship, Zion AG, Zion Tabernacle, Zion this, Zion that. It's uh, so Zion is pretty important. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, cool. So let's go to chapter sixteen, um, the local church, um, the vine and the branches, right? the vine and the branches. Uh, right, hey, can I request uh, one of you to read uh, John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, the scriptures in the notes. Okay, um, poor, poor Jeffina keeps reading all the time. Uh, let me get someone else to read. Um, but you better start reading or else I will choose you. <laughs> I will read Pastor. John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Amen. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Yeah. Thank you, Rosalind. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, so um, what are some of the things uh, that kind of stand out or stood out um, for you? Uh, once again, I mean, this is, uh, you would have heard at least a 50 sermons on this passage. Um, there's a sermon right there if you don't have a sermon for the Sunday and if you're preaching, you, you know, you have it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what are some of the things? Uh, and I would like for most of you, or every, actually I would like all of you to kind of share what are some of the things that stand out? or stood out from this scripture for you? You can unmute and speak or share in the chat section. Yes. Yes, Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, um, one of the things that stand out is like, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must produce fruit. Fruit means we multiply. That means like we are saying, we have a responsibility to equip others as a form of multiplication so that we can increase the yield. That's what stand out for me. All right, thank you. Yeah, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are expected to uh, be fruitful. Okay, all right. What else, guys? Thank you, Isaac. Okay, Zelatoli, what do you think? We are also to bear the fruit of the spirits. Okay. To bear the fruit of the spirit. All right. 
All right, so Bishu says, in order to be fruitful, we need to remain in Him. Okay. And what does that mean, uh, Subhishus? Prezi? Aradhana? Georgia? John? Jafina? Um, I like this too, uh, which says that uh, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Like uh, when he when when we prune a plant, we are doing it for its good and I think also I like how it says like God knows God takes away something so that he can bear more fruit in him and. Uh, yeah. I also like verse 7 where it says, Abide in me and my words uh, abide in me. So, reminding in him is more like a, uh, reminding in his words, and he also reminds us at what you desire. He's also looking into our desire. Uh, if you desire, if you desire according to my words, it's both abiding you and so listening to your desire. And that is how that Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. What else? Yeah. I think uh, this one beautiful picture that Jesus uh, talks about our intimacy with Him, um, that we are so connected to Jesus, and God considers us um, like nothing can be separated. And in the next verse, we read. Um, you cannot do anything without me so that's the kind of relationship that god has invited us to and um, and also um, to to have that attitude in everyday life that um that i cannot do anything without jesus and huh. god has told me to a special very close relationship that i abide in him and uh, his word abides in me yeah thank you all right one more person what else? There's quite a bit you can take off, right? Rosalyn, you read it. Uh, so what do you think? Of what kind of stood up for you as you were reading? I'm um, not sure if you're sharing, saying something. We can't hear you, Roslyn. See that you unmuted your mic. Uh, first of verse 5, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So right. without Jesus, we can do nothing, no matter uh -huh. mm. how, uh, how much we try if you want to do anything for god on our own with our mm. own um, mm. will or with our own um, good intentions right but if we don't include jesus in that it's not yeah. going to be fruitful okay okay awesome thank, thank you. you thank you Rose. Yeah, thanks guys for sharing your insights your thoughts um all right, what we'll do is uh, i mean because if you start talking about this uh we wouldn't want to stop so we'll pause here when we can we'll take a break and uh, we'll resume uh, where we left off all right i'll see you all in 10. <laughs>